Hello everyone, so welcome to our talk on goal direct medical therapy for patients with heart failure with redu reduced ejection fraction. Uh, this talk and these slides are part of the primary project uh, for residents starting CVICU uh, B rotation. My name is Mohammed Khan. I'm a hospitalist at UC and I'm joined by you can introduce yourselves. Yes, hello there. I'm Jen Cook. I'm one of the CVICUB attendings. Maybe meeting you on the on the wards shortly. Um, we're so glad that you're joining us, and hope that this presentation is helpful. And my name is Rich Hajar. I'm one of the cardiology fellows. Um, you'll see me around the CVICU, both A and B servers, quite often. Um, looking forward to help out. Okay. So uh, heart fa failure is a clinical syndrome in which there is an impairment in the function or structure of the heart. Um, and there are basically two types of heart failure defined below. Uh, there is the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in which the ejection fraction is less than or equal to 40% and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in which the EF is more than or equal to 50%. I'll ask Rich here about this, you know, this nomenclature of half ref and half PAF is something that's been new in the last decade. Have you been exposed to the old terminology of the old nomenclature? Not really. I think I, I would love to hear about what the old nomenclature is. I would think that mo most of the nomenclature that I've been, I've really been seeing around the hospital and as of late in my studies is always this half ref and half PAF with a reduced and also preserve ejection fraction. Well, but right. Yeah, the, the people who are, I don't have enough gray hair to be old, but I'd say that those of us that have been around for a long time, we used to call this systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure. And we moved away from that and actually have also added a head midref um, for those patients who have an ejection fraction that's between 40 and 50% midref. And then the fourth category, which I think is really valuable, is the recovered EF. So the half recovered EF um, from people who had half ref and then improved their ventricular function because we believe that's a different patient population than our half PEF population. So a little bit of trip down memory lane, but um, you'll be very well prepared if you are familiar with calling it half PEF and half ref. Right. Um, so for classification, uh, the first type of classification we have is New York Heart uh, Association, uh, which is a functional classification. It goes from class one to class four. Um, <clears throat> so class one uh, is for patients with cardiac disease, but without resulting in limited uh, limitation of physical activity. Um, class two, which is mild, uh, patients with cardiac disease resulting in slight limitation of physical activity, uh, class three is moderate, uh, patients with cardiac disease resulting in marked limitation of physical activity. And then class four is severe, uh, which is patients with cardiac disease resulting in the inability to carry on any physical activity without discomfort. Mohammed, have you seen any of my clinic notes in Epic yet? They're kind of rare. But one thing that you might see if you looked at my clinic note is me using class 3A and 3B. Have you ever seen that before? I haven't. No, no. So the heart failure doctors will throw you for a loop by doing that. And so it's something we probably should get you prepared for here on this talk. So typically when I'm in the clinic and I'm asking patients about their functional status, the questions that I like to ask are, can you climb a flight of stairs and can you walk a city block? If they can, they're class two. And if they can't, they're class three. Mm -hmm. But in the heart failure clinics, sometimes then we'll ask an additional question. Can you participate in ADLs? So the way I'd ask that is, do you have any difficulty breathing when you shower or prepare a meal or do the laundry? If they can't do that, they're three B. Oh, Okay. So and that's so that's 3A and 3B. Mm -hmm. so second classification we have is the American Heart Association heart failure stages. Um, so in this, the stages are from stage A to stage D. Uh, stage A is patients who have presence of heart failure risk factors, but no heart uh, disease and no symptoms. Uh, heart B, uh, sorry, stage B is heart disease and uh, is present, but there are no symptoms. Uh, stage C is structural heart disease is present and symptoms have occurred. Uh, stage D, uh, presence of advanced heart disease uh, with continued heart failure symptoms requiring uh, a goal-directed medical therapy. 
And one thing I think I can comment here, especially when you get onto the CBICU service, I think it's hard, it's important to classify these patients according to these categories, especially in your notes, because it makes it a uh, help for, for not just the other uh, physicians taking care of the patient, but also to kind of place that patient in a group. Now, oftentimes, I think Dr. Cook would agree that especially when they're on the CBICU B service, we're going to see a lot of those patients who are NYHA 4 and stage D. But as they move through their hospital course, it's important to re- recognize what brought them into the hospital. And so even even if they get downgraded to a lower level of care, it's important to classify what how severe they actually were at that time of presentation. Okay. Very helpful. All right. So uh, next slide, we have basically the drugs uh, that are used for uh, to optimize heart failure patients. Uh, and these are the part, these are the drugs that are part of the goal directed medical therapy. Uh, we will talk about seven classes of drugs. Um, first one being RNAs. Uh, or ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Then we have beta blockers, we have the loop diuretics, the aldosterone antagonists, uh, the combination of hydralazine uh, and isosorbide dinitrate, uh, ivabradine and SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, all of these, except for loop, uh, loop, reco- uh, uh, loop diuretics, reduce hospitalization and or prolong survival. I think this is a really important point and I, I'm Glad that you added that at the bottom of the slide, but I just want to emphasize when it comes to our loop diuretics, it's certainly the mainstay of the orders that we place for our acutely decompensated heart failure patients, you know, getting them diuresed and typically we're giving them IV diuretics, but loop diuretics do not improve mortality and do not have a physiologic benefit um, directly in the setting of acute decompensated heart failure. And actually I've got a whole slide deck on this. So I love to talk about this. Um, but um, so it might be something for rounds that you could that you could ask about. But the reason why, um, so we will diarrhea patients in the acute setting, but it's really up titration of these other agents is what's gonna save their life and reduce their hospitalization. So that's the reason why we've created this deck in this conversation today. So uh, guideline-directed medical therapy, uh, the principal goal of GDMT is to reach the maximally tolerated doses, uh, which will help to reduce hospitalizations, uh, mortality, and improve uh, functional capacity. Um, That's all I'd say about this slide. Um, So the next slide, we have um, four uh, principles that I've highlighted from the 2021 ACC update uh, on optimization of heart failure treatment. Um, Principle one uh, states uh, that GDMT with the highest uh, expected benefit should be prioritized. Um, And then these are the uh, different medication categories. Principle two states target doses are associated with best outcomes. Uh, Principle three states start GDMT immediately. Uh, And last principle four, uh, says attention to the clinical, social, and financial barriers to achieving GDMT should be prioritized. There are other principles, but these are the four that I've really highlighted here. I have to tell you that practicing with our PharmDs on the ward services is really a benefit when it comes to this because a lot of times doing those pre-authorizations for medications and and assisting with the discharge and the delivery of the medications at discharge really makes a difference. So shout out and kudos to our PharmDs. So the first category of drugs that we'll discuss is beta blockers. Um, Recommended beta blockers include bisoprolol, carbidolol, and metoprolol succinate. Uh, these should be started during hospitalization after dry state is achieved, which is a non-congested state. Um, the beta blockers are redu- uh, associated with reduced hospitalization and mortality at 90 days. Rich, when you have had an opportunity to um, start beta blockers and titrate beta blockers in the hospital, um, do you have any tips and tricks? And would you yeah. give any advice on how yeah. you would do that? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I think it all comes down to... Uh, it's individualized based upon how your patient's actually doing at that time. I think I take into a lot of different considerations. What's the underlying systolic function of the patient? Uh, What do they really come in with? What's their blood pressure? How much room do I have to work with their blood pressure? And the reason for that is because uh, a couple of reasons. One, um, obviously looking through these different agents, we have beta-1 selective agents and also, um, you know, obviously beta-partial agonists, alpha agonists uh, as 
in the carbidolol. So like metoprolol succinate is obviously select one beta, but bisoprolol, I think, if, correct me wrong, Dr. Cook, I think it has a little more higher affinity for the beta-1 receptor, uh, greater than metoprolol succinate. Both metoprolol succinate and bisoprolol really aren't going to have as much as a blood pressure reduction as would Coreg. So if I have a patient who's like, let's say, has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, who is also very hypertensive, my agent that I typically like to go after is carvitolol. And um, technically, ideally, I like to rapidly up titrate that medication um, because I'll get a better blood pressure reduction with carvitolol as opposed to metoprolol succinate or bisoprolol. Um, typically, I don't use bisoprolol too often. Um, so the two agents that I really kind of jump to are metoprolol succinate and carvitolol. I know that typically a lot of people like to use metoprolol tartrate and then transition to succinate, but I don't want to make Dr. Cook cringe. So, um, <laughs> you've already been warned about that, huh? Yeah. yeah. So I think that typically, um, I, I personally like to find that if I can find that, get the patient on a stable dose of metoprolol succinate, um, if they don't have too much blood pressure to work with, which is actually what I've been doing as of late. And the only reason I say that I've been more of a fan of metoprolol succinate as of late, more than carbidol is because I've been trying to get patients on four different medications, which we'll get into those four pillars. And I find that if I'm, I don't really know how a patient will respond when I start them on Entresto or Empagliflozin, that's, they have a huge diuretic effect. And so their blood pressure can drop or I might not know what their blood pressure is. So I've been finding that Metobol succinate has been kind of my go-to as of late because it's one, more predictable, and two, I don't have to worry about the blood pressure fluctuations with it, really. Yeah, I have to emphasize that, and I really appreciate your summary. It was very quite valuable for us. But the metoprolol tartrate is not in any guidelines, and um, you have to remember that metoprolol tartrate is supposed to be a QID medication. And so as you're up titrating a metoprolol tartrate, you can get to very dangerous levels um, after that, you know, once you get to the therapeutic dose and the PharmDs can explain that to you how the pharmacokinetics work. But I've seen many patients that have crashed in cardiogenic shock at our hospital because of rapid up titration of tartrate. So I really recommend against that. Um, and the other thing I'll say about beta blockers is if you turn back the clock, you know, when we first started with um, guideline directed medical therapy, it was thought that beta blockers were harmful in heart failure. But it was actually our basic scientist who looked at the effects of catecholamines on the myocardial tissues themselves and determined that it is the catecholamine surges that lead to depopulation of the beta receptors on the cardiac myocyte. And when that happens, there's a decrease chronotropic and inotropic effect for the beta agonists. And so basically what beta blockers do is they repopulate those beta receptors on the cardiac myocytes to give a more physiologic response so that they have the, the, at the chronotropic and inotropic antagonism again um, in a more physiologic state. So because we're talking about repopulation of the beta receptors, it typically takes a few weeks for that to happen. Um, so the positive um, inotropic effects that we see with beta blockers aren't going to happen with your acute titration, but you will see blood pressure lowering with an acute titration. And so I wanted to explain those two physiologic principles separately um, so that so that we understand that even in patients that have low blood pressures, we still up titrate their beta blockers, but we need to do so at a much slower rate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That, that was great. Thank you. So next drug we talk about next to beta blockers is the avabridine. Um, so it is indicated in patients with ejection fraction less than 35% and with not high two to four classification, classification. Patients should be in sinus rhythm and on maximally tolerated doses of beta blocker with a resting heart rate more than 70 beats per minute. Um, the SHIFT trial studied avabridine uh, and it showed significant reduction in hospitalization. Do you have any comments about that, Dr. Cook? I, I don't really. Um, you know, Avabradine fits a small population of patients that you can't titrate beta blockers because of blood pressure, but are still tachycardic. Yeah, I found that like the only time I've ever used it was I started on a patient early on in, in the hospital and realized it was very expensive for the patient. Um, and eventually they weren't able to afford it. So I think that it, it fits a small sect. Um, Small patient population, as Dr. Cook said. I haven't used it too often, but it's in the arsenal and I was tested on my boards about it. So it's definitely good to know. Oh, yeah, good to know. So the next category is the RNAs um, and the drug that 
we usually use is the Secubitril and Valsartan combination, also known as Entresto. It was uh, approved by the FDA in 2015 uh, for patients with chronic heart failure. Um, so it's indicated in ejection fraction less than 40% with NIHA class two to four. Um, RNAs are now preferred over ACE uh, and ARP. Uh, this was shown in the Paradigm Heart Failure Trial, which showed RNA reduced cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization by 4.7% more compared to uh, uh, lisinopril that was studied. So neprilysin inhibitors prevent the breakdown of a hormone in the body. Does anybody know what it is? Um, Nephrolysin. Well, it's part of the pathway, but it's the natriuretic peptides. Yeah, the BNP, correct? Isn't that, isn't yeah. that fascinating? So here yeah. we have a, a BNP that we're testing, and we're testing all of our heart failure patients, and we see that it's elevated. And why is it elevated? Well, the atrial stretch is leading to secretion of BNP so that the body will have an octeresis. <laughs> so basically, what the neprilysin inhibitor is doing is allowing the body's normal physiology for octeresis with natriuretic peptide to occur. Um, and so I think that's fascinating. I thought that I'd mention it because we, we measure BNP and NT pro BNP all the time. So understanding that this class of medication is working with that pathway, I think is valuable. But the second thing I need to mention, and this is just a trick and tip and trick from the outpatient setting of up titrating these medications is that when you start somebody on Secubitrol Valsartan, when you're switching them over from an ACE inhibitor to an ARB, you need to decrease the diuretic by half. So a lot of patients will not tolerate succubitrol valsartan. And the reason why they don't tolerate it is due to hypotension. And so if you leave them on their regular dose of, um, of loop diuretic, when you up titrate or when you start them on succubitrol valsartan, they'll become hypovolemic and orthostatic and hypotensive. So by a rule, the heart failure doctors will typically decrease the diuretic dose when you either up titrate or start succubitrol valsartan. That's a really, really great point, Dr. Cook. We see that in the CVIC a lot, and that's actually something I think is really important because especially in rounds, as a patient's about to get transferred down to, let's say, the Six South service or somewhere else, then what we tend to see is that um, as we uh, increase Entresto, I usually wait a couple, like 24 to 48 hours before uh, increasing again, just because of the diuretic response you get from Entresto, and we hold Lasix for, the, the, for that time. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's a really, really important critical point to note because sometimes um, this is something that you, you will see a lot and it's better to understand why. Um, the next is a combination of hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate. Uh, so this medication is indicated uh, in African-American population with NIHA class two to four um, who are already optimized on an RNA or an ACE inhibitor or an ARB and beta blocker and aldosterone antagonist. It is often neglected in our in eligible patients, um, but it has uh, shown benefits in reducing uh, mortality and heart failure uh, hospitalizations. Um, I have a comment to make on this one, um, which is, can you imagine a patient that presents with acutely decompensated heart failure and low cardiac output and a high SVR? This patient presents volume overloaded mm -hmm. and also with acute renal failure. And so typically when that happens, when we see a patient like that, we diurese them, but we also withdraw their ACE inhibitors, ARBs, secubitral varsartan, and, and um, aldactone because of the acute renal failure. And it can be extremely helpful in these patients, especially if they have um, high blood pressure to switch out those medications that you're withdrawing with hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate. So this is a trick that we'll use with acutely decompensated heart failure patients often, because what we know is that if we withdraw the afterload reduction while trying to diurese somebody, it further increases the SVR. So hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate can be very useful in that acute renal failure patient or that hyperkalemia patient that we are having to withdraw their neurohormonal antagonists. Mm -hmm. Um, next is aldosterone antagonist. Um, so the examples that we use is spinalactone and aplerinone. Um, so this is also used in patients with high class two to four, ejection fraction less than 35%. The contraindications are basically 
uh, serum creatinine. In men, it has to be less than 2.5, and in women, it has to be less than 2, and potassium should be less than 5. Um, patients should already be receiving RNAs or AACE inhibitor or ARB and beta blocker and have no contraindication before starting aldosterone antagonists. Um, also, it is not necessary to have reach, uh, achieved target doses of other medications prior to adding aldosterone antagonists. Rich, are there any patients that you've seen that respond super well to spironolactone? Yeah, I, I, I think that I personally love spironolactone. Um, I try to get it on all my patients, um, especially those with the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction as well. Um, typically, though, um, it's just part of the regimen that if I see their EF even less than 40% and sometimes, um, I know that it can, that 35 to 40% can always be very objective. And so if I see that they have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, I try to put them on, um, especially if they have consistent, consistent symptoms, I try to get them on aldosterone antagonist for sure. Mm -hmm. um, especially in the pre preserved ejection fraction. I know that it hasn't been shown uh, by the TAPCAT trial to really show a decrease in mortality, but if you actually, I have a whole separate talk about um, heart failure preserved ejection fraction, but my mainstay is that it, it has been shown to decrease hospitalization. You know, we'll have to get some feedback on this series and see if somebody wants a half pef talk for next year because that would be a lot of fun to do as well. I also, but, also, I think half pef is growing. Like, I think our patient mm -hmm. population. I think people would say. I think a lot of like residents. I get consults, just as many consults for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction now as I do reduced ejection fraction, Doctor Kirk. Interesting. Well, I'm glad that people are recognizing it. You know, the one additional thing I'll say about um, spironolactone, it is also my favorite medication, is that I had an aha moment sometime into my career, and it was several years into my career, I've been doing this for some time. And I realized that in internal medicine residency, we use spironolactone like 100 milligrams twice a day in our liver patients. And I had been taking care of these patients with biventricular failure who have <laughs> abdominal edema and ascites and not even thinking about that. And so I believe that patients that have right ventricular failure in particular do quite well with um, spironolactone. And right. especially when patients have abdominal distension, um, they get a lot of symptom relief by up titrating it. And I'll use it up to 50 milligrams twice a day. That's about as high as I go. And I think that that actually goes into, I talked to a gastroenterologist about this and a hepatologist, and they said it's it's just because spironolactone has been shown in their studies that when you have splanchnic dilation, it it does, it's, it's very well tolerated. And mm -hmm. even some of the liver studies are even going now saying that people prefer, I don't want to start an argument, but they even prefer like, um, in terms of beta blockers, they prefer corvitolol more than propanolol now. So I think everyone's kind of getting onto this. Let's go after the cardiac medication train. Cool. Yep. All right. Love it. So the last class of medications are SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, so these are indicated in patients with EF of less than 40, in patients with or without diabetes type 2, uh, with NIHA class 2 to 4. Uh, it causes osmotic uh, diuresis and naturesis. Uh, it decreases atrial pressures and has like favorable effects on myocardial remodeling. Um, so the important trial was basically the DAPA heart failure trial, which showed reduced death from cardiovascular causes, sorry, um, and lower risk uh, of worsening heart failure. Uh, it, it is not approved in uh, type 1 diabetics. I love this drug. Yeah, I definitely have been getting more and more experience with it. It's, uh, I, I'll tell you, Dr. Cook, the, uh, I found, and this is just recently as I started to use it when I was on consults, that if I put in Tresto with Empagliflozin, the diuretic response that I get is paramount. Wow. And are you prescribing it on an inpatient basis now? I, I've been having some, diff I'll be honest, I mean, I've been having more success at the VA than oh, sure. um, at, at the VA. I just say emperor, like emperor reduced trial. And, uh, and I haven't been getting any issues. I've been getting some um, insurance authorizations. You have to go back and forth, back and forth. And I've been having a difficult time getting it as a, a UC while inpatient, but it's been getting a little easier. Okay. All right. Yeah. I think that that's evolving. I know that we've been doing pre os for our patients and prescribing it at discharge because we hadn't been able to use it in the inpatient state inpatient setting yet, but I thought that was just the hospital trying to catch up. Um, so this is data from the CHAMP heart failure registry from 2018. Um, so it shows different classes of the drugs over here, the mineral corticoids, beta blockers, uh, ACE, ARB, RNA are combined, ACE, ARB, and RNA. Um, <clears throat> so in pink, we're seeing basically uh, 
the drugs that are not being used uh, in patients who do not have any contraindication. So RNEs, 86% of the patients do not have contraindication, but the medication is still not used. Um, and then an ACE inhibitor or ARB or ARNE, RNE uh, the group, we see that 72% of the patients are being treated rightly with the drugs. Uh, so it kind of shows us like we have quite some way to go in all uh, all the categories of these medications. It certainly isn't a very great report card, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a C minus. Um, it's important to remember that each of these drugs, you know, reduce um, mortality by about 30%. So, um, so spironolactone reduces mortality by 30%, yet there are 65.9% of patients who aren't even given it. And so we could save a lot of lives by doing a better job at following guideline directed medical therapy. And one thing, if I may add is, and Dr. One thing I always try to do when I'm on consults, and this is probably helpful for um, the residents as well, is that it's become like, obviously you have to look at each patient by themselves and individualize this therapy. But one of my goals, one of the things I try to do before their discharge is get them on as many heart failure medications at a dose they'll tolerate. Because I think I found that it's when patients are in clinic, sometimes it's harder to start a medication in clinic as opposed to up titrating a medication in clinic. I just wanted to know if you've experienced anything like that, Dr. Cook. Yeah, it's really, it's very important. And we've learned that patients that get started on beta blockers and get started on um, do, on different classes of drugs prior to discharge are more likely to remain on them and have better survival. So um, you're doing exactly the right thing. And I encourage everybody here to have the patience because that's the tough thing, especially in someone who has a new onset of heart failure. It takes extra days to get them on all the drugs, but it's definitely worth it to their lives. So this is an update uh, from American College of Cardiology, uh, basically talking about the quadruple therapy. So the ACE, uh, ARBs, or the RNA group, plus the beta blocker, the MRA, and the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, and it, what it basically says is uh, the cumulative risk reduction uh, in all-cause mortality. Uh, so if somebody's on all four medications, the quadruple therapy, the relative risk reduction is almost 73% and absolute risk reduction is 25% in patients who are on all four uh, of these therapies. So that's our last slide. Look at that number needed to treat, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that pretty amazing, Dr. Like Dr. Khan, yeah. Dr. Isn't that like, it's really remarkable. If you think of it, just to put it for the medicine residents to put it in perspective, statins have, uh, I believe a number needed to treat like one over like 80, I believe. So mm -hmm. this puts into perspective how helpful this therapy can really be, which is why when you see me running around with like a, a crazy person trying to get all these meds on, you guys will understand why. So mm -hmm. I, I think as long as you have this in your arsenal, um, you'll have a little more perspective on, you know, how much work and how much heavy lifting has to go on as we try to take care of these patients. That's terrific. And Dr. Khan, I have to say that this is one of the, the best collections of slides I've seen on this topic. So thank you so much for putting this together for us. And thanks for being our, our presenter today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. See you all in the words.